Hey there, dog lovers. Get ready to mark a special date on your calendar, October 5th to the 7th. Right here in the heart of Vermont during the breathtaking foliage season, I'm thrilled to invite you to the Canine Fusion Workshop. We're diving into the art of assessments, the joy of playful interactions, and the exhilaration of cane across. No matter your role in the world of dogs, this workshop is designed for all of us who cherish our canine companions. Join me in a passionate community of dog enthusiasts for an immersive experience of learning, connection, and growth. And here's the best part. Your experience will be complemented by the beauty of Vermont's foliage season. And did I mention that we've got your meals covered? Lunch, coffee, and snacks are all included. Reserve your spot now by visiting our website, vermontdogboardingandbehavior.com slash workshop. Let's fuse the magic of training, play, and cane across into an unforgettable experience. See you on October 5th. Time again for Talking Dogs with Ian Grant, owner of Vermont Dog Boarding and Behavior, VFW Drive Hyde Park. It's the show that delves into the training, socializing, behavior, nutrition, and wellness of your dog. And brought to you by Guy's Farm and Yard, with locations in Morrisville, Montpelier, Williston, and St. Albans. And we're back with the trainer, Ian Grant. And this week, it's part two of our series the called The Power of Fear. And dogs are probably the most vulnerable when they're fearful of, uh, no matter what they're fearful of, and yet have to be very careful with uh, how you uh, deal with them and train them at this point. Yeah, because it just as much as they're you know classified as predators, they can have a prey state of mind, and when they have that fear kind of overcome them, they can just you know they can turn up into that little ball. They can become very fearful and uh, prey, prey state of mind, as in they're the ones that are being preyed on. You mean? Yeah, they feel like they're you know their life might be in danger. How do I survive this? You see some dogs, it's awful to see, and we want to try to get them out of it as soon as we possibly can. And, you know, last week when we talked in the first part, it was more of what does fear look like and making sure that we're giving them direction, give them something to do. But sometimes fear can just lock up a dog. I've had some people, you know, show up to my place for lessons. The dogs are in a new place, and they're trying to get the dog out of the back end of the car. And when they won't come out because they're so fearful, oftentimes this is when I see people become um, too forceful. Too forceful. That's a good word. I've been <laughs> physical has been in my head, but they, yeah. that sounds awful. Mm. Forceful, yeah, because oftentimes they put the leash on and then they just start to drag the dog out, which mm. makes them just revert even more back into that fear. And then if they don't, if they can't drag them out, then if it's a smaller dog, then they're just going to pick them up. And now we're forcing somebody into an elevator that doesn't know what an elevator does, and we're pushing the 100 button, and best of luck. Yeah, and we're making them even more fearful. It's Yeah, but also, too, this is the one thing that we're losing out of all this. It's trust. Because the dog's looking at this. This is my opinion, just from my experience. The dog looks at it and goes, you have no idea how I'm feeling right now, right. and you're still doing this to and me. And you're still trying to drag me out of here, yeah. and you, can't you tell what I'm feeling at this point? And those are the times, and uh, you know, in these situations when I have a dog that's fearful to come out, I stop everything. Stop, hold on, stop, stop, stop. Let's do this slowly because this is the time. We're training already. We've <laughs> The session has started. You're dealing with something here. Let's talk about this. Let's focus on teaching the dog what we want out of this and being as gentle and as respectful as we possibly can because we are just being too forceful with these dogs. Uh, you know, oftentimes dogs are very fearful going to the vet and they, mm. you know, we force them into this small room and this strange person with a stethoscope comes over and mm. sometimes those are just pressure cookers in their tough environments. But we have to take our time because if we don't, this is just going to be so detrimental for the dog. Mm. Now, how long could it possibly take? Let's say you go back to your example of mm -hmm. the dog that's in the back of the car or something, and uh, it's just determined it's not going to come out. Uh, yeah. So how do you go about it and not being there for an hour or two hours? Yeah, because also when you look at this, food, the dog is not going to take food. You could put a raw steak in front of this dog, and the, guys, the dog's going to go. That, it's that fearful. Yeah. The, why would you eat being that scared? Yeah, how could you? Yeah, absolutely. So in those situations, this is where I'm going to toot my own horn for a second because this is where leash work comes into play, knowing how to read the body language and teach the dog what you want. So it took me just a couple of minutes to get that dog out of the car. But, and this is the big but, in the past, we I think we did an episode called Repetitions of Success, mm, you know? Right. So as soon as the dog got out, guess what I did? Put him back put in. Put it back in and then got it back out and then put it back in. So the dog can learn, wow, nothing bad is actually happening. This guy understands me. I can start to trust him because he hasn't done anything 
detrimental to me. And then I hand the leash over to the owners to have them do it. But oftentimes we just get into a rush and we, we can't. And, you know, when we talk about the power of fear, fear takes over everything. When a dog starts to think, how am I going to survive this? Food doesn't matter. Or anything, really. No, no matter what you're, the owner is saying, it's just not, it's not computing. Yeah. And the flip side of this, too, is in a car, a dog can only go so far away. You know, they're up against right. the back seat. They can't go anywhere. So we have to be careful because that fear of moving backward can turn into, well, I'm going to just come out swinging. I'm nipping. Nipping, yeah. biting, lunging. Yeah. And then you're really and now, moving backwards. <laughs> yeah, so this is this is how... So it's leash work that you're able to do, so I guess it's something you should be working on before this incident happens then. Yeah, I'll put a little tension on the leash, not a lot, in my direction, just until I see one of the feet move in my direction. So you don't yank, you just... No. Just, just minimum, minimum yeah. pressure. Yeah. The best way I can describe it is this. So you and I can remember this. The radios in the past and the car that had the dial on it, we had to tune in just right. Otherwise, right. there was sta- static in between right. the radio stations. This is what we're doing really slowly. We're trying to get rid of that static and trying to get the signal perfectly clear. So for me, I'm just really slowly, gradually tension on the leash until the dog just starts to move. And then I put all sorts of uh, – I relax the leash totally. So the dog learns if he moves in my direction, all that leash pressure goes away. Hmm. And then we just repeat that and then yeah. build on it. Right. Patience is a oh, virtue in this point. You absolutely. Yeah, because if you don't, it's uh, you're going backwards. Yes. Back with our question from the doggy bag in just a moment here on Talking Dogs. Roaming is a Los Angeles-based premium lifestyle brand that is motivated by nature. Roaming features high-quality, earth-friendly dog products made from renewable and natural materials like their bio-based and 100% compostable biodegradable dog poop bags. These bags really are awesome. I've been using their bags for a few months now and I love the durability, the way they feel, and the fact that they are good for the earth. They also have a special discount for our listeners. Use code VermontDog to get 20% off your first purchase, including 20% off the first three orders if you sign up for one of their poop bag subscriptions. They also have some beautiful leather leashes made right here in the USA. You can check them out at roaming.com. That's R-O-M-N-G dot com. Back to Talking Dogs with Ian Graham from Vermont Dog Boarding and Behavior, VFW Drive Hyde Park. Find out more about his facility and programs by going to vermontdogboardingandbehavior.com. Question this morning, Ian, is how do I redirect my dog if he starts lunging at a dog that he sees? Oh, good question. That's uh, that's a delicate one. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, first answer is here, there's not much you can do other than create space because if the dog is already lunging, you're past what we call the threshold. Yeah, they're already <laughs> – So what do you do at that point when it's already past that point? We have to get far enough away. And what I tell my clients is get far enough away to where your dog can actually hear you again. For each dog, that's different. I can't tell everybody just to go back 100 feet and you'll be totally fine because it just doesn't – every dog is different. It doesn't work that way. Go back far enough until you can say your dog's name, say, come on, and the dog looks at you like, okay, now I'm relevant again. Right. (laughs) I'm still here on the other end of the leash. When they look at you, then you've got their attention. Yes. Mm. Once you get that, if you, you have two choices. You can either pick another day and not return and just move along, or you can work on it. But if you work on it, you hang out in this area. Maybe do side to side work, not go towards the stimulation. Mm. Just so you can kind of recreate, or not recreate, but get the brain back on you and less about the stimulation. And then over time, you just try to get closer and closer. But once you get across that threshold, there is zero training that you can do that will be remembered by your dog. Right. That's all there is to it. So sometimes that's just getting out of there is priority number one and then deciding, do I want to work on this or do I not? And go from there. But you can almost feel that it may be coming, though, if you're walking towards a dog. Mm -hmm. I mean, you should be kind of getting the idea instead of getting within 10 feet and then it lunges. You should act really before that, shouldn't you? Yes, absolutely. Unfortunately, I, I hear from a lot of clients that when the dog does this, what I hear is that came out of nowhere. But we're not looking at it as far as how, you know what our dog normally does under those circumstances and that it's building and building. We don't see the eye contact yeah. and the ears perk up. We just see these big, huge displays, and then it's too late. Yeah, yeah. But it just shows you how much in tune you have to be with your dog, working with them every day, and you 
sometimes detect these things. Yes. If you have a question for Ian, you can email him directly to info at vermontdogboardingandbehavior.com. Next week, the topic is Prey Drive. That's P-R-E-Y, not P-R-A-Y. <laughs> <Right. laughs> so what do you mean that by that? Prey Drive is what dogs have that want to chase small animals and take off after them, and it can be a big problem in, in the dog world for owners. Yeah. So that's not the street next to yours. Uh, it's not Prey Drive. <laughs> no. Well, you hope not anyway. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> On Talking Dogs with Ian Grant, brought to you by Guys Farming Yard, locations in Morrisville, Montpelier, Williston, and St. Albans. And for the trainer, Ian Grant, I'm Roland LaJoy, and we are Talking Dogs. Talking Dogs.